Okay, welcome back and let's continue with rapid review of step one. So what are the common food sources which you will see in your exam which are associated with staph aureus food poisoning? So classically meats and cream based food like uh, mayonnaise and custard and what's the form of toxins? It's the preformed enterotoxin, right? That's why you get food poisoning quickly. How can you prevent food poisoning from staph aureus? Proper hand washing during food preparation, right? What are two organisms which, you, which you'll think which are common for causing osteomyelitis in patients with prosthetic joint replacement? You have to answer staph aureus and staph epidermidis. Now in step one, they'll give more clues for staph aureus, right? They'll mention the, that it's gram positive coca, it's coagulase positive. You have to know the virulence factor for staph aureus. What's the virulence factor for staph aureus? It's protein A, right? And now you also know that in IV drug abusers, it can cause infective endocarditis, especially in the right side of the heart that strike a spit valve. Now the timeline of this infection is also very important. So if someone has prosthetic joint, and if it's an early onset infection, like for example, time to onset after surgery is less than three months, you have to think about Staph aureus as the most common organism. If it's delayed onset, for example, three to 12 months, you have to think about coagulase negative staph aureus. And if it's late onset, that's more than 12 months, then you again have to think about staph aureus, okay? So less than three months and more than 12 months, it's staph aureus. And if it's between three to 12 months, is coagulase negative staphylococci. Can you name three bacteria which are the most common cause of meningitis in neonates? There's a mnemonic, B-E-L, bell, right? It's a, it's not a happy bell, it's a sad bell, meningitis in neonates. That's group B, strep A, galactiae, followed by E. coli, followed by listeria. Now, since listeria can cause meningitis in neonates as well as elderly patients, so if you see any case of meningitis in neonates or elderly patient, you have to add ampicillin for listeria meningitis. So what empiric antibiotics would you give for the patient's between age 2 to 50 if they are coming with meningitis. You give vancomycin and thorazinosin cephalosporin, like for example, ceftriaxone or cefotaxim. What if the patient is a neonate? Then you add ampicillin. So vancomycin, thorazinosin cephalosporin, and you add ampicillin. What if the patient is more than 50? Then again, same, vancomycin, ampicillin, and thorazinosin cephalosporin. So you remember by mnemonic CVA, it's uh, ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and ampicillin. And of course, you add steroids initially, and you later discontinue if it's not streptococcal pneumonia meningitis. How can CMV be transmitted? Three important things, sexual contact, organ transplant, as well as transplacentally, that's vertical transmission. So you have to differentiate whether that's an infection by Neisseria gonorrhoeae or Chlamydia based on the characteristics of discharge. So Neisseria gonorrhoeae is, is, is uh, going to cause sexually transmitted infection, right? Like urethritis, cervicitis, prostritis. And the type of discharge is usually white, creamy, and purulent discharge. Whereas Chlamydia is mucoid to watery discharge. What's the name of the bug which can cause syphilis? That's Treponema pallidum. Which bacteria can cause acute pelvic inflammatory disease? Your answer should be Neisseria gonorrhoeae. And what if it is asked which bacteria causes subacute pelvic inflammatory disease which often goes undiagnosed? Your answer is Chlamydia trachomatis. And the strains of Chlamydia trachomatis are usually serotypes from D through K. So D to K. One of the important clues which you have to look um, in the question is Cervical motion tenderness, that's characteristic of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. Can you tell me an organism which can cause ventilator-associated pneumonia or respiratory therapy equipment-associated pneumonia? Pseudomonas aeruginosa. What do you think, which bacterial infection you'll think if the patient is coming with profuse watery diarrhea, fever, chills, the leukocytes are high, creatinine is high, um, and the patient has history of using antibiotics and colonoscopy is actually showing pseudomembranous colitis. So what's your answer? 
it's clostridium difficile infection you have to think always of watery diarrhea you don't necessarily need colonoscopy for diagnosis you can just do stool um, toxin demonstration uh, nucleic acid amplification test um, you don't need to look for the bacteria itself because it can be even present in normal patients so always look for toxin in the stool and what's the preferred treatment for c diff it's fiduxomycin metronidazole is an old treatment so either you can use fiduxomycin or oral vancomycin remember it's oral vancomycin it's not iv and for step one for c diff you have two toxins right exotoxin a and exotoxin b exotoxin a actually binds to the brush border of the intestine it could cause inflammation and ultimately cell death and watery diarrhea and um, exotoxin b would actually disrupt the cytoskeletal integrity and it would depolymerize the actin and ultimately leading to you know enterocyte death and necrosis and that's classically the toxin responsible for causing pseudomembranes in the colonic mucosa what antibiotic would you use for conococcal meningitis ceftriaxone what's the empiric treatment for pelvic inflammatory disease that's ceftriaxone plus doxycycline if you have confirmed gonorrhea infection with negative chlamydia then you can just use ceftriaxone and if you have unconfirmed infection you don't know what it is then you have to use ceftriaxone plus doxycycline and doxycycline is actually preferred over azithromycin um, for chlamydia coverage which area in the brain is responsible for triggering nausea and vomiting that's ctz right chemoreceptor trigger zone also called as area postrema and can you tell me a drug which can antagonize serotonin activity so that actually antagonizes the serotonin receptor on the vagal efferents of the gi tract so it will ultimately decrease the vagal stimulation and that's a powerful central acting anti-emetic drug what is that ondansetron now before giving ondansetron you always have to check one thing what is that you always check ekg to look for qtc right if qtc is more than 500 millisecond then you might have to use an alternative drug for nausea and vomiting and what can happen with prolonged qt interval and if you give more uh, qt prolonging drugs what arrhythmia can patient have that's polymorphic ventricular tachycardia also called as torsades de pointness um, how would you treat tdp or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia you to treat it with magnesium sulfate very important and of course if the patient is hemodynamically unstable then you have to give unsynchronized shock that's defibrillation now after blocking serotonin receptors what other drugs which you can think which can help with nausea and vomiting which can be h1 receptor blockers diphenhydramine and meclizine now the thing is that once they block h1 receptor it can also cause more sedation and they can also have concomitant anticholinergic effects so it's you have to be careful in elderly patient so if you give diphenhydramine in elderly patient they may have acute urinary retention because that's an anticholinergic property which drug which you can think uh, can antagonize dopamine receptors in the area postrema and help in nausea and vomiting it also increases gastric emptying metoclopramide now let's say the patient is having some muscle contractions and uh, his neck is spasmed after giving metoclopramide what is that that's acute dystonic reaction since it's also helping in gastric emptying um, so which patients do you think would have delayed gastric emptying diabetic patients right so it can be used in diabetic gastroparesis or sometimes gastroparesis due to post surgical disorders or any other stuff now let's say you give metoclopramide because patient was very nauseous and now the patient is having acute dystonic reaction how would you treat that acute dystonic reaction of course you have to stop metoclopramide and give diphenhydramine that's first generation antihistaminic drug and just to keep in mind metoclopramide can also cause qt prolongation so you have to be careful in patients you already have qt prolongation 
Now in the chemoreceptor trigger zone or CTZ or area post trema, they also have neurokinin 1 receptors, also called as NK1 receptors, which are activated by substance P. What drug can block NK1 receptor and help with nausea and vomiting? Epipitant. Now we know diphenhydramine and meclizine are H1 receptor blocker. Can you name some H2 receptor blockers? Like cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, nizaridine, these are all H2 receptor blockers. Now think about um, these H2 receptor blockers, especially cimetidine. They are potent inhibitors of cytochrome P450 system. So they would have multiple drug-drug interactions. So you have to be real careful. Let's say if someone is taking statin and they take cimetidine, if you are giving enzyme inhibitors, that means the levels of statin would go high and patient would have higher chance of myositis or myotoxicity. I usually remember these enzyme inhibitors by a mnemonic called as Coke and Pi, C-O-K-E and P-I. So cimetidine, omeprazole, ketoconazole, erythromycin, that's Coke, and PI, that's PI, stands for protease inhibitors. Now, these are enzyme inhibitors. So, you have to be careful in patients taking other drugs, so they may have drug-drug in interactions. And you know this, how they can ask the questions, right? If you are taking warfarin and if you give enzyme inhibitors, the levels of warfarin could go high. In contrast, if you are taking enzyme inducers, like for example, phenytoin, the levels of warfarin could go down. Right, so they can ask either way. Which drugs can irreversibly inhibit the proton potassium ATPS pump in the GI tract? And the final common pathway of the acid secretion is blocked in the stomach? Proton pump inhibitors, right? And for example, like omeprazole, isomoprazole, pantoprazole, lansoprazole. Now, thing with this PPI is. You have to remember it can cause increased risk of infection because you are losing the acidity of the stomach. Second, it can increase the risk of C. diff infection, like the infection we talked about. Also, pneumonia. It can also increase the chance of osteoporosis and B12 deficiency. What's the first line treatment for Sollinger-Ellison syndrome or gastrinoma? It's going to be PPIs, right? Can you tell me a drug which is an osmotic laxative that's actually a non-absorbable sugar that would pull the water in the intestine and soften the stools. That's Miralax, right? Also called as polyethylene glycol. Miralax is actually a brand name. And uh, if someone is having colonoscopic procedure, they would have to drink four liters of Miralax that's not absorbed in the gut. So you drink four liters of Miralax for for that colonoscopic procedure for the clean out. Now that solution is usually with electrolytes that has sodium, chloride, bicarb and potassium and that mineral -like solution is called as go lightly. Similar to mineral -like, lactulose is also a non-absorbable sugar that can act as an osmotic laxative. And remember lactulose is also used to lower what? Ammonia in patients of hepatic encephalopathy, right? And let's say if you cannot use lactulose, what's the second drug which you can use for hepatic encephalopathy? Rifaximin. Now, mechanism of lactulose is important for hepatic encephalopathy. So, lactulose would be actually metabolized to its acidic metabolites. And when you have some acidic environment, it can convert ammonia to ammonium ion. So NH3 to NH4 plus. Now once it is ionized form, it cannot cross the cell membranes. So that trapped ammonium ion would stay in the intestinal lumen and it will ultimately be excreted. So if the patient is having hepatic encephalopathy, you keep giving them lactulose until they have at least three to four bowel moments in a day. If the patient is comatose or unconscious, if you cannot give through oral or NG tube, you can also give lactulose enema to the patient. So again, lactulose will be metabolized to lactic acid and acetic acid. That environment will become acidic and it will decrease the pH of the intestinal lumen. And the ammonia would be converted into ammonium ion and that ion will be trapped into 
into the intestinal lumen and ultimately be excreted in the feces. And if you cannot use lactulose, the other drugs are rifaximin, right? And those are actually poorly absorbed antibiotics that actually eliminates ammonia producing bacteria, and thus it will decrease the production of ammonia in the intestine and treating hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, so that were osmotic laxatives. Can you tell me some stimulant agents which are cathartic, which can be helpful in constipation? They are Senna and Bisacodyl. So Senna and Bisacodyl are cathartics or stimulant agent and that actually stimulates the enteric nervous system and they would also increase um, some colonic secretion. So you have to keep in mind if you are prescribing opioids to some patients, you have to empirically give them this bowel regimen, right? You have to give Miralax and Senna or Miralax and Bisacodyl. Chronic use of Senna is associated with one side effect. What is that condition called as where you see pigmented colon after chronic use of Senna? Melanosis coli. Now let's say if the patient is having diarrhea. Now, and let's say if the patient is, you know, a child and the patient is having bloody diarrhea with fever, would you give them loperamide? You should not. That's actually a contraindication. They would um, retain more toxins and bacterial toxins if you give loperamide by slowing the GI uh, tract mobility or motility and it would increase risk of more toxic megacolon. Now, if someone is having diarrhea, now diarrhea can be of two types. That can be secretory diarrhea or osmotic diarrhea. Osmotic diarrhea would never happen in the night time. Osmotic diarrhea, that means if you are eating something osmotically active, that means you'll pull water and then you'll, you'll have to go. That's osmotic diarrhea. Secretory diarrhea, patient may even have to wake up in the middle of night and they would have diarrhea in the middle of night as well. So that's the classic differentiation. Uh, mechanism wise secretory diarrhea it's you know it's a type of diarrhea where fluid is actively being secreted into the stool and can you name few conditions which can cause secretory diarrhea it can be you know infectious cause uh, apart from that it can be vipoma or carcinoid tumor and if someone is having secretory diarrhea caused by vipoma and carcinoid tumor you can use one drug which is somatostatin analog what is that? Octreotide. What's the other place you can use octreotide? When the patient is alcoholic and is coming with upper GI bleed, you want to give octreotide, right? So it can be used for acute variceal bleed. Now this octreotide can be used in other causes of secretory diarrhea like chemotherapy induced diarrhea, HIV induced diarrhea or short bowel syndrome. Okay, let's see if you remember. What are the two drugs which I talked about which can prolong QT and cause torso at its points? Ondansetron and metoclopramide. Good. What's the name of um, that cytokine which is released from virus-infected cell, virus-infected host cell, which can be used as part of some treatments as well? Those are immunomodulatory cytokines called as interferons. Can you tell a place or disease where interferon alpha can be used in hepatitis B and C infection, right? And if you use pegylated interferon, that's pegylated interferon, you can use that in a less frequent doses. So that's once a week dose. So remember A, B, C. Interferon alpha treats hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Now it can be also used in treating hairy cell leukemia and malignant melanoma as well. How do you treat flare-up of multiple sclerosis? That's steroids, right? IV steroids. How would you treat multiple sclerosis uh, for its maintenance phase, specifically relapsing type? Interferon beta. Very good. And where can you use interferon gamma? Can be classically used in CGD, chronic granulomatous disease. So it actually, by if you give interferon gamma, interferon gamma would activate macrophage and that may not be otherwise be able to deliver that oxidative burst. So by giving interferon gamma to patients of CGD, it can reduce the incidence of serious infections by, you know, helping with oxidative burst.
Now talking about that oxidative burst or respiratory burst. So when you have oxygen, oxygen will be actually converted into superoxide ion with the help of NADPH oxidase, right? It will use NADPH and it would be that NADPH would be converted into NADP plus with the help of NADPH oxidase, oxygen will be converted into superoxide. Now this NADPH oxidase is actually deficient in CGD, chronic granulomatous disease. Now that superoxide ion will be converted into peroxide with the help of superoxide dismutase and um, that hydrogen peroxide can be actually converted into hypochlorous acid HOCl with the help of myeloperoxidase and that hypochlorous acid is actually the one which is responsible for killing bacteria. Now that MPO can be deficient in myeloperoxide deficiency. In bottom line, you have to remember NADPH oxidase, which is deficient in chronic granulomatous disease. And as a treatment of that, you can use interferon gamma.